More than 105 of the 129 schools chosen by the Chicago Public Schools for Clothing are on the west and south side. This is over 90% of their total number of schools. Students from low-income families will be unfairly impacted by these punitive closures. There is a web of debt that's entangling the entire world. What we have in the state of Illinois are 868 school districts. One school district, Chicago Public Schools District, has no elected board representation. What's happening in Chicago in our public school system is not happening in Los Angeles, is not happening in New York City. Both districts have more pupils than the city of Chicago. So what exactly is going on in a school district of 411,000 children that saw an explosion in charter school growth in 2005, 2006, from 15,000 to 56,000 students? These two systems cannot coexist. We're talking about a school district that has 411,000 students. 411,000 students in over 600 buildings. When we close 54 schools, 61 buildings, we're talking about elementary and middle school education. 13% of our elementary and middle schools shall be closed under the current dictates of the mayor. If you don't have a school in your neighborhood, you do not have a future. You have a hood. No school in your neighborhood is nothing but a hood. Hi, my name is Antoinette Smith, and I'm affiliated with Local One at CIU. And I'm here because I care about the kids. I'm a grandmother, I'm also an aunt, and I have children in the public school system. And we are urging Mayor Rahm not to close these schools because our neighborhoods depend on children's education. We are not going to take it no more. We're letting you know we will fight, fight, fight till we get tired. Mayor Rahm, have some compassion for our children. Our children want a better education so they can have a great job, so that we can have safer communities and a safer Chicago. We're living in two Chicagos. We're living in the Chicago downtown, and we're living in the Chicago we have to go home to. We are tired. We want our kids to be safe. CPS board is not walking through these neighborhoods while they're making up these things about underutilization and why they want to close these schools. They're not walking through these neighborhoods and seeing what's going on in this neighbor these neighborhoods. And I doubt that they will come out during the hours in which our children will have to go to school and come from school and, will, and walk through these neighborhoods with their children. I really doubt that this will happen. You live, we, a lot of these people live in drug-infested, gang-infested, pedophile-infested, crime-infested neighborhoods. You have extended the school days. Children would then, if they were to close these schools, children would have to get up extra early, walk in the dark, especially in the wintertime, walk in the dark to these schools, and then walk back in the dark. And let's be honest, when you, have, when you, when you live in these communities, you have buildings that are not kept. So that means in the weather that we see today, you have sidewalks that are shoveled. So that means you have children, young children, maybe the oldest is 11, walking his siblings through the street trying to get to school for an education. And I, my, my thing is, is this a safe passage like they're telling us they have, or is this going to become a middle passage? Are our children going to have to die in order to get to school? Are our children going to have to go through circumstances, situations that we wouldn't even ask of high schoolers, let alone adults to go? through in order to be able to have an education. We're making this as if this is if, as if education is a luxury. It's not a luxury. Safety is not a luxury. It's a right. We cry and we and we do all this thing and put on the news about innocent children who have a bright and better future being shot. But yet we're saying we're going to put you on the front line and let's see what happens. They, it's, it's time out for us being on the defense. They need to be on the defense. Answer our question. What is your plan for our schools? What is your real plan for our children? Stop giving the media all these pretty little pictures and fables and stories about, oh, it's under utilization. No, you're, you're worried about your business. You're worried about your corporation. You're worried about your pockets. That's what you're worried about. You're not worried about our children, and you're not worried about their safety, and you're not worried about our communities. We no longer have to answer to you. 
you need to answer to us. Furthermore, talking about the school district, we believe in equal suffering. We believe in shared sacrifice. We believe in shared pain. But why in a school district says 40% African American or 90% of the school consolidations, closing turnarounds, and charters only affecting the black and Hispanic population? Something is wrong. 30,000 students have now been traumatized. Why am I so angry about this? There, it's an oxymoron to tell your child the school has failed. Tell me as a grown man I failed. Tell me a school system has failed. But you have to be illiterate to know, not know the definition of a school. A school by definition cannot fail. They say our school is 58% utilized. I can say our school is over 70% utilized and they can be and they are wrong because our school is being used, the whole school is being used to the fullest of its capacity. They're not count, taking account of that we have a clinic that works not only for our kids, but for our whole community. They're not taking account of our stadium, our media library that we just got built this year that takes up two classroom spaces in our school. They're not taking account of the three recess rooms that we have to use because it's not safe for our kids to go outside and play in the playground that's designed for them. They're not taking account of the community fitness and art room, music room, special ed classrooms, and et cetera, for, that, that's being used inside of our schools. But they keep saying, what well, they're saying that our school is underutilized by 58%. They give us a number saying we have 398 kids in our school. I say you're wrong. I say we get an influx of kids throughout the school year. We got close to right now, in the month of Mar um, February, we have a total of 425 kids in our school. Closing our schools and just throwing us on a, li on a list, you're destroying families throughout our whole community. Then we got to go out and find where we're going, what kind of school we're going to send our kids to. We have to go find, you're destroying the churches because the, the churches in our neighborhood, we've been going to for years. You know what I'm saying? We're, it's it's kind of heartbreaking to us, for you to tell us we're closing your school. That means for me as a renter, I got to uproot my family where I've been staying for the last 10 years and move somewhere else so I can find a school that better benefits my kids. When it's a school right across the street from my school, right across the street from my home, that's adequate, that's big enough to feel, fulfill my kids' needs right now, today. The task force came up with a master facility plan that CPS was supposed to have done. They didn't do it. They getting another slide by to wait until May to get this master facility plan done. I say that's full of crap. You should have did the master facility plan first before you came up with the closing list. Then we wouldn't be here right now fighting, fighting with CPS when the parents and CPS should be getting along because you're doing the great services to our kids. But no, now we have to fight with you to keep open something that we deserve, that we pay our taxes for anyway. We're inundated with schools that are on this closing list. To close every school between Sacramento and Cicero from Kinsey down to the expressway makes logically makes no sense. And to put these parents, to put these children, to put everyone through this exercise to get to a point where you're only looking at a couple of items is wrong. It's wrong to have our little children have to come up here to say to save their school or to put the parents through the stress of all of this. We started this conversation with 20 plus schools in the ward on the list. Now we're down to nine and we still we will not rest until we get our schools off. As we said, we want the same thing the kids in Lincoln Park have. We want a Garfield Park. We want the same thing the kids on the north, far northwest side have. We want those kids to have the same thing. We want that on the west side of Chicago. 
We want our tr children to get, be given the resources they need to be successful, to be competitive, so that they too don't end up in the penitentiary because the design of the plan is to send our children to the penitentiary where others get rich, and we will not have that. We will not stand for that. That's why we're here today to fight for the resources for our community, to fight for our schools to be open, and fight for our schools and our children to have what they need and what they deserve. The truth is that in the city of Chicago, we are currently under pestilence of violence, a pestilence of despair. But there is hope. There is always hope. Those of us that work with children in poverty and in children who are wounded and traumatized by their lives. But those of us that get up every single morning and go to work do so with joy. And do so knowing that the work we do will have an effect. But there are those among us who do not do what we do, but who have an awful lot to say about other people's children. And it's time for us to take back that conversation and talk about our children. And demand that our children have access to the quality education that their children have access to. All children are deserving of art, music, history, real history. They are deserving to go to schools that are named for people that mean something, that have a cultural connection. But if you're closing schools with names like Addicts, Bon Tom, Mahalia Jackson, Jesse Owens, Marcus Garvey. There is a disconnection. Brothers and sisters, we can easily find out who the winners and losers are. And especially when somebody else defines that for you. But it is always important to ask the question, who made the rules to the game? Because whoever made the rules to the game will have an advantage, won't they? Oh, yes. But brothers and sisters, it's not just enough to know who the winners and losers are. It's not just enough to know who made the rules to the game. You have to ask yourself one more question. What are the stories the winners tell the losers to keep them playing the game? And what the winners tell the losers are, this time will be different. This time, your children are going to get a quality education. This time, we're going to move the resources from over here to over there so we can more efficiently educate your children. This time will be better. How many times have we heard that one? How many times are we going to continue to allow ourselves to be fooled by people who do not understand the lives of our children? I'm going to ask you a question. How do you decide to close 61 buildings with and consolidate two different school communities without the people who understand the safety, the neighborhood being part of the decision-making process. That business people 
and politicians who do not send their children to public schools, and those particular public schools have way more say than the people who actually send their children to these schools. Who gets to make that decision? Brothers and sisters, I am telling you that the way the Chicago public schools are run is worse now than it was when Benjamin Willis in the 60s, when Martin was here, it's worse. Because now we have people who are so arrogant and are so full of themselves that they would put the lives of 30,000 children, almost 3,000 homeless children, in harm's way to make a point. Brothers and sisters, there's something wrong with that. And it's not just happening here in Chicago. It's happening in Detroit. It's happening in Philadelphia. It's happening in Washington, D.C. Brothers and sisters, it is time for us to take back our schools. Whose schools? Whose schools? Our schools. Brothers and sisters, you will be told a lot of lies. You will be thrown out numbers. I've heard them say, we lost 145,000 children. 145,000 school-aged children have left Chicago. That would make people believe that 145,000 children have left Chicago public schools. But brothers and sisters, it is a lie. I heard the vice president of the Chicago Public Schools get on national TV and tell that lie. Yes, I'm calling them out for being a lie. They will lie with impunity. The truth is 30,000 children, 30,000, not 145,000. Then they step back from that lie and say, well, we have 100,000 empty seats. Brothers and sisters, that too is a lie. So we can get bedazzled by numbers, but the beauty of the Chicago Teachers Union is we have a research department. And every time they tell a lie, we can do the math. Brothers and sisters, I'm asking you all, support our neighborhoods. Support our children's right to go to their neighborhood schools where they have relationships built with people who get up and care about them and work with them every single day. Not people who come in to teach for a while and then go to the rest of their careers, but people who care about our children, brothers and sisters, we are in some very dangerous times. If we allow these people to do this harm, I will guarantee you that it is our children who will suffer. My name is Shay Hillsman. I'm an eight-year veteran of the kitchen in Chicago Public Schools. I've worked at hundreds of Chicago Public Schools. And I'm out here today with my co-workers, fellow parents, and community activists, and what we hope to achieve today is fair conditions for everyone in Chicago Public Schools. Our communities have been ignored and neglected for a long time. I'm glad that I'm out here with my fellow co-workers in support. Yes, I'm a, a food service worker, and we're also represented by Unite Here. Today is just the first step at towards creating and stopping the, the school closures so that we have promising, thriving communities. I myself grew up in an impoverished community, and I know that the schools serve as one of the only havens. So I'm hoping today to accomplish them, not to take away the, the one only pillar that we have left in most communities. I talked with my grandmother on the phone, and it was very refreshing. She asked me, where are we doing the civil rights movement? And she said, it sounds like it. And when I got here, it really resonated. It feels like we're in the same fight as the 60s. Our school was in crisis, whether it is in Chicago, or Philadelphia, or Newark, we, but the worst, one thing worse than slavery, that's to adjust to it like it does not matter. 
one thing worse than oppression is to adjust to it as if, as if oppression does not matter. Dr. King came to Chicago, 1966, one of the Chicago schools on the south and west side to look back Chicago schools on the north side. Here we are 47 years later making the same argument, trying to make south and west side look like the north side, and that looked like Nutria. And so it is, these kids take the same exam after 12 years, but the results are different. One scores high, one scores low. One goes to school, one goes to the university. We must not adjust to that predicament. What strikes me so much as I walked with Sister Karen Lewis on last week, uh, the calls that struck me different was from people who, with whom I related a long time who are friends, who are saying, why are you guys marching with the union this time? You know, we're going to have better schools for our, our children. Why are you marching? So, well, you know, we've been marching for these children since the Willis Wagons in 1966. We've been marching quite a while. So well, what's your beef? I said, my beef is suppose you have a better school. Suppose the school is this nice oasis in the desert, and a woman has three children and no job. Well, she could send them to three different schools across different gang zones. Uh, in the area where the city that has the most killings of any city in America. Well, the, the mother would like for a child to use a computer at school, but there's no computer in her house. She is on She's on fixed income. I have three kids at two different schools, and there's a very, very real possibility that I'm going to have three kids at three different schools in the next couple of years. And the idea that you sell that, well, if schools are failing, the kids just go to a new school, and that will force the old school to do better. And so losing their enrollment is going to make them work harder to do better, and that's totally losing sight of what's best for kids. Kids do best when they're in an established community. They have consistency year after year after year. And if you're moving your kid from school A to school B to school C to school D every year to try to find them a better school, to force the lower performing school to do better, it's not better by the kid. The kid needs to make the same friends and grow those relationships. And schools do best when they have a deep, deep, deep community, which is why Lozano, for all the struggles that it's been through, is still there because they dig deep. And as a parent, I don't want to schlep my kid around to three different schools. You know, I don't, you can't, you can't have them make good friends the way they would make good friends if they were in the same community year after year after year. So I think that's a failing strategy, and I think it's doing making the kids serve the interest of CPS instead of CPS serving the interest of the kids. We are extremely concerned about the number of closings on the list um, and how this will impact our most vulnerable students. In, addi in addition to special ed, there are 2,508 homeless students on this current list, and we calculate there are over 6,000 children in special education uh, with IEPs on this list. Of the 129 schools, 39 of these schools have special ed cluster programs. Moving children with autism and other disabilities is not the same as moving computers and desks. The people who are currently managing um, this process are brand new. They have not been on walkthroughs through many of these schools. I've been through on a number of walkthroughs in every network, and I invite the press to come out and look at some of these schools, and you will see that the utilization numbers do not match the reality. Um, we implore CPS to use some common sense Everybody knows that they cannot handle transition plans for over 6,000 kids with IEPs in one year. I know personally, as a parent with a child with a 504 plan, that it is nearly impossible to get decent services from a very stable school environment. So the prospect of trying to do this in one year with 6,000 children is beyond absurd. It can't happen, and we know it can't happen. We're working with parents already, with special education attorneys, and we will continue to do whatever we can to make sure that this doesn't happen, um, both from a safety and uh, special ed and all of, all of these uh, angles. It's just absolutely wrong. Uh, my name is Rini Hayback. I'm with the Chicago Coalition for the Homeless. More than 2,800 homeless students will be affected by school closings. We're concerned about this because these children 
as all high-risk children, desperately need stability. The same adults, the same curriculum, a sense of safety and continuity. Massive school closings utterly undermined the emotional and physical needs of these children and destroy their education. Every time a child changes schools, they lose four to six months of educational time. And this has a real impact on all our children. So we oppose school closings and we ask the community to join us in protecting not only homeless kids, special needs kids, and the 30,000 kids who are going to be moved, homeless or not. And I'm with the Abortion Girls Club. And actually, I'm here for the Lafayette and the Von Humboldt School. If those schools happen to close down, the Boys and Girls Club not only will be losing over 600 kids that come in on a daily basis to our program, but we know that they're not going to find their way to other schools. So to the mayor, please do not shut down our schools. Uh, this is Alderman Ricardo Munoz from the 22nd Ward. Uh, and I, we're obviously here in support of the CTU, in support of our working brothers and sisters who want to protect our neighborhoods, who want to make sure that these school closures don't devastate our neighborhoods. The West Side Branch of the NAACP calls an end to the educational apartheid. More than 105 of the 129 schools chosen by the Chicago Public Schools for closing are on the west and south side. This is over 90% of their total number of schools. Students from low-income families will be unfairly impacted by these punitive closings. This continues. Closings have nothing to do with the importance or the improvement of their education. But it is designed to destabilize families and communities and scatter the education of thousands of black and brown students. This genocide against our community must end. The West Side Branch of the NAACP demands today an end to this educational apartheid.